Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Pigeon from the from Corporate European Observatory. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start by thanking the Budget Control Committee for its kind invitation to contribute to such an important uh, discussion. The uh, version of uh, my speech that you have is a bit outdated, so pay attention for differences. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction of what CEO does. Uh, Corporate Europe Observatory is a research and campaign group uh, working to expose and challenge the privileged access and influence enjoyed by corporations and their lobby groups in EU policy making. We are a rather small organization. We have about 15 employees. Half is in Brussels. The other half works in different member states so that we have, so that we don't become too much of um, uh, insiders. Um, talking of... Um, so we campaign, as you can hear, uh, against the capture of policy making by commercial interests, by proposing a stricter regulation of lobbying, by campaigning for alternative policy proposals when possible or relevant, when we have uh, something to say, basically, and by campaigning for better integrity regulations for the EU institution themselves. And I will insist on this latter part in my uh, speech. So uh, we, are, we are a research organization in the sense that we produce information and the reliability and accuracy of this information is crucial to our credibility. I wanted to echo some of the comments that were made earlier about journalism. The problem is not that journalism is not independent, but the problem is really a quality problem um, because quality costs and when you have uh, a media whose uh, imperative is primarily commercial or political, uh, quality becomes seen as a cost and not as an asset. And this, I think, if any public, if any public intervention needs to, be, uh, needs to happen there, I think that's more on these lines because independence doesn't exist in abstract. It only re exists you know, relatively, and you don't want to ban uh, you know, certain political expressions because simply you don't like them. Or you're just going to end up reproducing uh, problems that you're describing anyway. Uh, so we are a research organization, but we are also a political organization, as you can see simply from our choice of uh, topic. Uh, we choose to study corporate lobbying, not all lobbying, in the hope of helping to redress the power imbalance that we witness every day between commercial interest and the rest of society in European politics. Now, what are the financial interests of the European Union institutions? That's an interesting question. Uh, but I don't think the question can be separated from what one believes their purpose should be, and, but I also think it cannot be separated from the question of the actual powers, options you're looking at. Uh, and I will start and spend some time on an example taken from my work and that you probably have heard of uh, already a little bit because I often write to you about it in the context of the annual budget discharge procedure, the independence policy of the European Food Safety Authority. Um, Two words of description. In the words of the head of its legal affairs uh, unit, EFSA is a quasi-legislative body. So getting a positive risk assessment out of it is an absolute condition uh, for any food company willing to get an EU market approval for one of its products. It can be food additive, pesticides, GM crops, food packaging material, or health claims. It's very wide. It's anything touching the food chain. However, the hundreds of scientists uh, EFSA is working with um, on its scientific panels and working groups are not paid at all. Uh, they only get their expenses reimbursed. Furthermore, the agency hardly does any in-house research. It does not really have a budget for this, but rather bases its work on the applications sent to it by the companies uh, who, need, who need to get their product approved. Uh, these applications contain scientific studies performed or funded by the companies, and these studies obviously never say something is really wrong with a product at stake, otherwise they would never get sent to the agency in the first place. EFSA then complements these studies with searches in the scientific literature to the best of its abilities, and there are other issues there that I won't get into for now. So from a narrow financial perspective, it really sounds like a good deal. Uh, EFSA gets top expertise and recent relevant research for free. But you know what economists say about free lunches? Uh, qualified scientists need to be paid by somebody. And I think this is the core reason why there are so many conflicts of interest among the scientists uh, working on those panels. Most of the financial conflicts of interest we documented in the agency were coming from research funding and consultancy contracts involving companies regulated by EFSA. 
it gets worse. Because companies have to spend a lot of money on these studies, which incidentally favors large group over SMEs, they refuse that anyone else than EFSA see them because they argue that they contain trade secrets. And of course, since the studies are secret, you cannot check whether a secrecy is justified. It's very convenient. As a consequence, EFSA is cut from the scientific community because no scientist can double check what EFSA does and how, whereas testing other people's research is the only way research can advance. So we end up in situations such as the ongoing uh, drama on glyphosate, where the scientific process is completely blocked because independent scientists and institutions such as the uh, International Agency for the Research Against Cancer cannot access the data EFSA and other public regulators used. So politics is all that is left uh, to cut through that debate. And although I think you'll always find me defending the need for political debates on technical issues, political debates where the key facts are debatable are so much more interesting, aren't they? And because this process is so visibly weak, the EU ends up in an indefensible position. So do you still find that the money saved by, F by EFSA on access to expertise and data is a good saving, or is it a cheap saving? <clears throat> of course, it would be pointless to increase EFSA's budget without solving its independence problems at the same time, and I am not suggesting that uh, centralizing everything in-house would be the solution to everything. But the message I really want to convey to you here is that creating an administration with very important regulatory powers and very little resources is a receipt for disaster. On the other hand, of course, to have to deal with such a weak administration is actually very good news uh, for the corporate lobbyists whose job it is to target it. You know, who doesn't like free help? There is another dimension to corporate lobbying where the financial interests of EU institutions are at stake, obviously, and we've heard about it already, and I will uh, only speak briefly about it. It's EU subsidies and funds. Uh, I suppose you're familiar with, I've, I've heard about the excellent work of the group farmsubsidy.org uh, on the recipients of the uh, common agriculture policy. We owe them a lot of information, such as the fact that uh, many recipients of these subsidies uh, actually don't really need them, uh, like the British monarchy or uh, small companies like Nestle, uh, whereas those who actually need them, like family farms in particular, don't, re don't receive enough of them, when at all. Um, at CEO, we've also done some work, uh, not enough in my taste, but on the corporate research budget, Horizon 2020. That's not small money, that's, uh, that's the third biggest EU budget, 70 billion euros between 2014 and 2020. And uh, it looks like the substantial portions of this fund have been transformed into industry subsidies that do not seem to generate much additional research. One particular example for this we looked into uh, lately is a public-private partnership called uh, Innovative Medicines Initiative. So that's a PPP between the uh, European Commission's money and the pharmaceutical industry's research facilities that they love, of course. And that cost the EU more than 2.5 billion euros since 2008. Uh, there's a really open question as to this translated into any additional research at all. Um, I'll finish with a broader and more uh, political point, and uh, that's more my personal opinion, actually. On the cost of, ex of excessive corporate influence on EU policies, it's more indirect, of course, but I don't think it isn't significant. Uh, I can think of three main points. <clears throat> the first one, of course, is the cost of bad regulations. Uh, there are many examples of this, and uh, a recent one in particular, I think uh, my colleague from Transport and Environment is going to uh, talk about it much more, uh, is the, um, uh, the flowed methodology for setting biofuels target in transport fuels. Uh, that, has, I mean, that has created a very destructive uh, industry out of nowhere, and it really shouldn't have. Uh, the Commission now is now saying that it will phase out this target completely by 2020, and that will be good news. The second point, of course, is the cost of non-regulation where it would be needed. Uh, there is a very interesting line of analysis here, which consists in measuring the opportunity cost of non-regulation. So, for example, simply it means that the failure to remove bad products from the market or uh, to tackle oligopolies and cartels translates into very high levels of lost innovation. 
Uh, and I want to insist a bit here that uh, for the, that's more for the European Commission, but cartels can be about so, so much more than price fixing. It can be about standards, it can be, it can be about many things. Uh, but more classically, the costs of non-regulation are quite obvious. Uh, I think we're all quite familiar to them. You can think about the insufficient regulation of financial speculation and banking activities that triggered the 2008 uh, financial crisis, whose costs are now in the trillion euros range. The absence of meaningful regulation on tax evasion uh, that is undermining social security system all over Europe. The decades it took to start to start regulating tobacco use, even though we know for, and we've known for decades that the stuff kills half of its users, and I'm a smoker myself. Uh, the slow, very slow regulation of toxical, toxic chemicals, you can think about the ongoing big battle around the regulation of endocrine disruptors at the EU level. And, uh, well, uh, the impossibility to introduce meaningful environmental, environmental conditions to cap subsidies whereas we are experiencing the fastest biodiversity collapse ever recorded, or the fact, to, to take a very local example, that the streets of Brussels were still completely clogged with uh, fossil fuels powered cars in the hottest month of April ever measured. Uh, my last point is going to be, in many ways, the, the elephant in the room, or at least one of the big ones. Uh, the political cost of not being able to produce legislation that would serve the European public interest because of the flaws of the current EU structure itself, upon which we know that corporate lobbying had no small influence. There are, of course, counterexamples, and I can think about uh, victories we had at the European level from the progressive side, and I'm certainly not going to dismiss them, but... Um, I don't think I need to insist much on the political consequences of the EU's inability to stop the social and fiscal race to the bottom it has organized for the, 15, for the past 15 years. Look at Greece, look at Austria yesterday, look at Brexit, look at the European youth whose future is being sacrificed in most EU countries south of Germany. Look at, to take my personal country, look at the case of Mrs. Le Pen, who won the latest EU elections in France without any meaningful program else than proposing to defend wor workers with racist policies and leaving the euro. That gets you elected, apparently. So, I will stop here, but I have hope that, I hope that I have made clear that uh, keeping politics independent from corporate lobbying as much as possible, <clears throat> investing into independent expertise, supporting quality journalism, is in favor of the financial interest, the integrity, and actually the very relevance and credibility of the EU institutions themselves. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Wir kommen zur letzten.